the light of guidance and salvation. The majestic prophet, I lay his salam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Anbiya'i wal Mursaleen Amma ba'id fa'uzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Al salatu wa salamu alayka ya Rasulullah Wa ala alika wa ashabika ya Habiballah Al salatu wa salamu alayka ya Nabiyallah Wa ala alika wa ashabika ya Nurallah there are many virtues and blessings of reciting salutations upon the best of creation sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And it has been stated that a person who recites durood once upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers ten mercies upon that individual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes ten of that individual's sins and elevates his rank by 10. Subhanallah, that a person who recites durood once, you mention the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala showers 10 blessings upon you. 10 of your sins get removed, and your, your status gets elevated in the court of Allah by 10. And remember here, when we talk about somebody's sins being forgiven without repentance, this refers to minor sins. Sagheera guna. The major sins, the kabira guna, uh, the ones that a person, which are, which are considered grave sins, big sins, they are only removed through tawbah, repentance. But these small sins, like for example, when you perform wudu, your sins uh, are falling off your body, or when you recite the rood and Allah forgives your sins, or when you do another action of good deed and Allah forgives your sins, this is all referring to small minor sins. Major sins are only forgiven through repentance. We should always uh, make tawbah in the court of Allah. We should constantly do tawbah in the court of Allah. When there is a new tree, a baby tree, a fresh tree, its roots are not embedded into the ground firmly. To pull that tree out is easy. But when you, if you want to pull that same tree out, after years have passed and it's embedded its roots firmly in the ground, then it is very difficult to uproot that tree. In the same way, when a person, he commits a sin and he repents straight away, it's easier for that person to remove the desire of that sin from his heart and give up that sin. However, if a person delays it to such an extent that years have passed, now to remove the sin the tree of sin whose roots are embedded in your heart is very difficult. So we should always try to make tawbah in the court of Allah, preferably uh, every night before we go to sleep because we can pass away in our sleep, obviously. That, Ya Allah, forgive me for the sins I have committed, knowingly and unknowingly, intentionally and unintentionally, whatever it may have been, Ya Allah, forgive me for it. And in, undoubtedly, uh, you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the most forgiving, and you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. Sallu ala al-Habib sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Welcome back to the program, the Majestic Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in which we talk about the khasa'is, the shama'il, the jamal, the beauty, the extraordinary personality of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we're trying to cover it from different aspects and different diversions. Uh, we have covered the topic of love, as in what is love, how a person should love the Messenger of Allah, what are some of the signs of muhabba, how did the companions show their love towards the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now we have moved on to the second segment, uh, you could say our second part of our series in which we are talking about the mu'jizat, of the, the miracles of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we covered the greatest miracle which is given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that was Al-Quran Al-Kareem. And the second biggest mu'jaza to be given to the Messenger of Allah is Al-Isra wa Al-Mi'raj. And we are covering that. We have covered the, the brief journey of when the Prophet Sallallahu 
I went from Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Subhanallahi Asra bi Abdihi Layla min al Masjid al Harami ila al Masjid al Aqsa. We have covered the journey of when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala took the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa, and uh, then above to the heavens and beyond that to the Lama Khan, a place where there is no place. And we covered some of the wisdoms behind this travel as to why the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam was taken on this travel. We covered the timings. And then we also covered some of the signs, meaning the things which he sallallahu alayhi wasallam saw on that night. We heard about the story of the man whose head was being crushed, scattered by a boulder. We also learned about the people who do not pay their zakat upon time. We also talked about those people who are pure wives and husbands at home, but they go out and commit haram. And then we talked about the seeking barakat from the uh, places of Baraka, for example, Baytul Lahm, Bethlehem, or Mount Tur, the, the mountain in, upon which Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam spoke with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these were some of the things we covered. And today we will cover the meeting which took place between the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and some of the extraordinary uh, things that took place. And when the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he came back and uh, the matters after that. So when the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam was going in the heavens, he met a prophet at each stage. And this is very interesting because when the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam left Al-Haram to go to Al-Aqsa, all the prophets were already present in Al-Aqsa and they prayed behind him. And then when the Prophet alayhi salam went to the heavens, those same, some of them prophets were already in the heavens. And this goes to show you the speed of the Prophet wasalam. And this is something that is very beautiful that they, the Prophets were there before the Messenger of Allah wasalam, Even though the Messenger of Allah wasalam, is the greatest of them. He is the Imam al He is the leader of the Anbiya. Yet before he got into paradise, there was already Sayyidina Musa, Sayyidina Isa, Sayyidina Ibrahim, Sayyidina Idris. They were waiting for him. What is the reason behind this? And the reason behind this is that when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would go somewhere, the Prophets والسلام, would be present there. And they would be there as a sign of honoring him. They were there. It's as if when a king is going somewhere, but some of his custodians go there before him to make arrangements, to welcome him, to make him feel homely, to go and tell the people or to show his status that the, our master is coming and you need to have everything prepared. And this was the case with the Prophet wasallam. that when he went into the heavens and the prophets were there waiting for him, this was as if they were honoring the chief guest of honor. They were honoring their master. They were honoring the man of the hour. They were honoring the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and this is why they were in heaven before him. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam goes to the Baytul Ma'mur and then to the uh, Sidratul Muntaha and then to the Arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet says that at one stage all I could hear were the pens writing, meaning the qalam, which the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in different stages of the Quran. And in different hadiths it is mentioned. And the Prophet says that all I could hear at that stage were just the pens writing. And they were writing the destinies of the people. Anyway, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he goes to the La Makan. La literally means no and Makan means place. So he went to no place, meaning there was not a direction, there was not a, a jihad there. And he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the eyes of his head. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu was was given the gift of 50 salah, 50 prayers. And he took those and he brought him down. And when he brought him down, he saw Musa. He met Musa on the highest level of heaven. And Musa said, Ya Rasulullah, your ummah will not be able to pray 50. Go back and ask your Lord to reduce it. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah decreases it from 50 to 45. And then the Prophet alayhi salam comes down and Musa once again says, Ya Rasulullah, go back. Your ummah will not be able to handle this. They will not be able to pray this. Ask your Lord to reduce them. So he goes up once again and it comes down to 40 
then this happens again, it comes down to 35, then it happens again, it comes down to 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, and 5. And now when it comes to 5, so the Prophet has been 9 times now. So then Musa says, Ya Rasulullah, your Ummah will not be able to pray 5. And now the Prophet said that, I feel haya. I feel embarrassed going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That my Ummah will not even be able to pray 5. I, I, I can't go back to my Lord and reduce it even further. Now there's many beautiful aspects that can be taken out from here. The first is that Allah said that whoever prays five times will be given the reward of 50. So when we pray five, we are given the reward of 50. I think if you were given 50 prayers, you would have to pray every 37 minutes or 47 minutes uh, we would have to pray. And today when we only have five prayers, we cannot take out 25 minutes, 27 minutes to pray the, all these prayers. So imagine if you had 50 prayers obligatory upon him. The second thing which is very uh, amazing and further strengthens the belief of the Ahl Sunnah is that some people did reject the Anbiya helping them after their death or benefiting from the uh, Anbiya or people who have passed away after their death. And my simple question is to them is who, upon whose mashwara, upon whose help did the 50 prayers come down to five? If you don't believe the Prophet is helping after their apparent demise, then you should be praying 50 prayers because you should not accept this. But yet we accept it and we pray. So that means, that means we know that the prayers are actually five and they were reduced through the help of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Thirdly, didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know that eventually there will only be five prayers which will remain? So he could have, Allah could have reduced him by 45 in the first go or give five in the first go that there wouldn't have been a need for the Prophet to keep coming back. But the reason Allah gave 50 and then reduced him gradually was to show how much love he has for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he wants the Prophet to keep returning back to him. It's as if uh, without any comparison in this world that if we truly love somebody, we will find excuses to stay in touch with him, we will find excuses to go to him, we will find excuses to meet him, we will find excuses to do all these different things. And it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is finding ways to bring the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam back to him so the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam can get more happy, the Prophet alayhi salam can see Allah, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam can increase in his uh, level of uh, loftiness because every time he would come uh, in proximity to Allah, every time he would return, there would be an exaltation in him. There would be, he would be exalted even more. And this was because of the vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Prophet sallallahu came back to al makkah al mukarramah and he was sat there and Abu Jahl came to him and he said, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you seem a bit worried, you seem a bit stressed, has something new happened? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes. And Abu Jahl said, what happened? And he said, I traveled uh, in the night and I went to Al-Aqsa and then I came back in a short space of night. And Abu Jahl, he went ballistics over this, he went crazy over this, he goes, how is this possible? He goes, are you willing to testify this in front of the people of Makkah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, I will. So Abu Jahl, rather than taking the Prophet to him, he called the whole of Bani Quraysh and he said, look, what is Muhammad saying? Muhammad is saying these uh, outrageous things. He's saying these uh, uh, things which make no sense because back then it would take a camel one month's travel to get to Al-Aqsa and the Prophet ﷺ done it in a short part of the night, Laylan, a short part of the night. And when the people came and the Prophet said that this is what happened. I traveled from Al-Haram to Al-Aqsa in a short space of the night. So the people, they started to test the Prophet ﷺ. They said, if you travel, then you know, then tell us how many pillars does Masjid Al-Aqsa have? How many doors does it have? How many windows does it have? So they started to question the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ stood in the Hatim. It is that uh, semicircle around the Kaaba. And when he stood there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifted the whales from front, in front of him and he could see directly in Al-Aqsa, Masjid Al-Aqsa and he told them how many pillars there were, how many doors and windows there were. And this should have been enough evidence for them to believe the 
what the Prophet ﷺ said, and to believe him to be the prophet of truth. But there are people whose hearts have been sealed, whose hearts have been veiled, their eyes have been veiled, their ears have been veiled, they, are, they cannot see the truth. And these were those kafirs, these were those, and the mushrikeen in Makkah, they did not accept the Messenger of Allah. It is as if a blind man, if you take him outside and you point towards the sun and you say that the sun is present there, even if you say 10,000 times, that blind man will say no because he does not see the sun. And when Abu Jahl went to the Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and he said that, what would you say about a man? Would you believe that a man traveled from Al-Haram to Al-Aqsa in the short space of a night? Abu Bakr, will say, Abu Bakr said no. And then Abu Jahl said, look, this is what your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is saying. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr says that if that is what the Prophet alayhi salatu is saying, then I believe him. You, even this is small, I believe the revelations he brings from the heavens. I believe them. So this is nothing in comparison to that. And when this news was taken to the Prophet and said that Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu has affirmed what you have said without even thinking, without even questioning, without even evidence. That is when the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said that Abu Bakr has been made a Siddiq. Abu Bakr is Siddiq from now on and this was the title which was given to him. And this was the miraculous journey of the majestic Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to from Baytul Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa and into the heavens and then above that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then when he came back and those amazing incidents that took place. This is one of the great uh, miracles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and this is something which is an astounding and an astonishing journey of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It has never happened before and it will never happen again as well. This is one of the specialities of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to grant us the love of the Messenger of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive any mistakes that have been made. Ameen bijahil nabi al-ameen wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallu ala al-habib sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He brought us the light of guidance and salvation. He brought us the light of guidance and salvation. The majestic prophet alayhi salam.